All right, AP Stats, here is your uh, last set of notes before the AP exam. All right, so um, these are three whole units, um, units five through seven. Miss King already covered unit five, so I have six and seven to cover the graphic organizer for. It's a lot of information, and um, I'm going to uh, just sort of explain how we have everything set up so you'll be able to use it quickly during the AP exam. All right, so units six and seven were basically confidence intervals and significance tests for the proportions and for means. So to keep this graphic organizer um, as organized as possible, we have one column for confidence intervals and one column for significance tests. I am going to show you um, the formulas and the ideas for both proportions and means. I'll designate proportions with a P and means with an M so that you can see the difference. Um, so remember you've got four main pieces of these confidence intervals and significance tests. You have state, plan, do, and conclude. You want to make sure you address all four parts when asking, uh, if, when they ask you to perform a confidence interval or significance test. Um, now I'm thinking that since the test timing is so limited, they might ask you to do a piece of this test. So either the state part, the plan part, the do part, or the conclude part, or maybe a combination of one or two. All right, so starting off with confidence intervals, we're going to do the whole left column. Confidence intervals, first part, state. You're going to state state the parameter you want to estimate. Okay? So the parameter that we're trying to estimate for proportions is obviously proportion. And we use P to symbolize the true population proportion, right? Now, if this is a means test, we're trying to find the true mean which we use the Greek letter mu to symbolize the true mean of the population. So these are the parameters that you want to estimate using your confidence interval. Your confidence level is what they tell you in the problem. It could be 95%, it could be 97%, 99%, so on. That's your confidence level. All right, the next piece is plan. All right, so you're going to name your inference method. All right, and so for both of these, you're going to have a one sample blank interval for blank. All right, so if it's proportions, it's going to be a Z interval. If it's means, it's going to be a T interval. So one sample Z interval for proportions, one sample T interval for means. And that's just the name of the test, right? So you use Z for proportions and T for means. All right, you're going to check your conditions. The conditions are pretty similar for both uh, proportions and means. So the first two are exactly the same, right? You, number one, your random condition. And for this, you want to have a simple random sample. You want the problem to tell you simple random sample. And remember, our random condition is so that we can generalize to a population. If we don't have a random sample, we cannot generalize to a population. Our second condition is our 10% condition. And basically what we want to know is that the sample size, little n, the sample size is one-tenth of the total population. And I could use big N for that, right? So the 10% condition is used to show independence, right? So if it doesn't say that, um, like say for example, if uh, we do not sample with replacement, if we're sampling without replacement, we cannot consider that sample independent. Um, but if we meet the 10% condition, then we meet the exception of that condition, and we can use our formulas. So 10% condition. If it tells you that it's an independent sample, then you don't need to use the 10% condition. All right, and then the last condition, is for normality, right? All right, so you've got two different tests for um, 
I paused the video briefly for a phone call. I can't remember what I was just saying, but normality condition, it's um, separate for proportions and for means. So you've got two separate tests. For proportions, you have large counts. And what that means is n times p hat must be greater than or equal to 10, and n times 1 minus p hat must be greater than or equal to 10, right? Your successes and your failures must both be greater than 10. All right, remember p hat is your sample proportion. All right, so that's for proportions. For means, you have a different normality test. For means, if the population is approximately normal, then you can assume the sample follows um, a normal distribution. If the population is not approximately normal, then you can use the CLT, right? So if your sample size is greater than or equal to 30, that central limit theorem applies, and you can say that your sample is approximately normal. And remember, we need our sample to be normal so that we can use our Z table and our T table, right, to calculate probabilities. Okay, so um, if your po population, if we don't know anything about the population, and if you don't meet the central limit theorem, what can you do? If your sample has no strong skew or outliers, and we would show that by a drawing, right? Remember when we actually had to plot out samples on a dot plot to see if it was approximately normal, if it had any strong skews or outliers? So basically, if you don't meet this one or this one, and then you can go to this level right here. If your sample has no strong skew or outliers and you prove that with a drawing, then you can assume normality. So those are your three conditions and don't worry if you bled into this box right here because I'm just going to say same as this box. But right now we're just talking about confidence intervals. But these two tests have a lot of similarities. Alright, so again we have the state part. State the parameter you want to estimate. You're estimating proportion or you're estimating mean. Remember it's not p hat and it's not x bar, right? I know what those are. I don't have to estimate them. They come straight from my sample. I'm using that sample to estimate p or mu. The confidence level they give you in the problem, that's what you use to actually develop the confidence interval. For the plan, you're going to name your method. One sample z test for proportions or one sample t test for means. I know what you're thinking, well, what if we have two samples? I'm going to cover that on the back of this graphic organizer. All right, then as also as part of your plan, you're going to check your conditions. The random condition, so we can generalize to a population. The 10% condition, so we can assume independence. Um, or the normality condition, so that we can say our population is normal and we can use Z tables and T tables to find our probability. All right, now here's the actual part where we perform the test, right? Do calculate the confidence interval. Um, so your ending product is two numbers, right? This number to this number, an interval. So your statistic plus or minus your margin of error. All right, so we're gonna have two separate formulas because we're talking about two separate things, right? Proportions and means. So I'm gonna do the best I can to sort of um, space this out and write this story. You can see it and use it during the AP exam. Okay, I went ahead and um, wrote down the confidence interval formulas for proportions and means and then we can talk through them. All right, so for proportions, you have p hat plus or minus z star, which is the z critical value, times the square root of p hat times 1 minus p hat over n. All right, so what each of these things mean? p hat is your sample proportion, right? So whatever sample they give you, the sample proportion is used as p hat, and it will be um, between 0 and 1, right? Um, so say your PI is 0.2. You would put 0.2 here. You would put 0.2 here in the formula. And this 1 minus 0.2 would actually be 0.8. So that's how you could use P hat to fill in those pieces. The Z star or the critical value depends on your confidence level, right? So for example, if we have a 95% confidence interval, 
we're going to calculate our z star by first figuring out the tail probability. So I drew a sample normal curve. If I'm trying to get a 95% confidence interval, that means 5% will fall on the outside of that confidence interval. 2.5% above it, 2.5% below it. So our tail prob probability is 2.5%. To convert that to a decimal, it will be 0 0.0250. Now here is where I go to our formulas, which I'm using the formula sheet um, within Schoology that's uploaded. And I'm going to look for this tail probability of 0 0.025 in the chart. So looking here, I see it right here. See this 0 0.0250? So if I look to the left, I see 1.9. And if I look above, I see 0 0.06. So my Z, grit critical value Z star is 1.96. Remember, I change it to a positive number. So my Z star for a 95% confidence level is 1.96. And that should sound familiar because we've done 95% um, confidence intervals a lot, right? All right. And then I think the only other thing that we need for this formula is small n or little n, which is the sample size. All right, so remember you have a plus and a minus, right? So if you're writing your sample interval, you're going to have a lower bound of the interval, comma, upper bound. So p hat minus this margin of error gives you your lower bound number, and p hat plus the margin of error gives you your upper bound number. All right, let's take a look at the confidence interval for uh, means. So same sort of setup, you have your test statistic, which is either p hat or x bar, right, from your sample. So x bar plus or minus t star times s sub x over square root of n. And again, um, these are all things that we know how to calculate. The x bar comes straight from the sample, right? It's the sample mean plus or minus the t star. So we do the same type of thing that we did for the confidence interval, um, for the proportions confidence interval. It's just now instead of using the z, uh, I'm sorry, instead of calculating the z star, we're finding a t star, which just means we need to use table B instead. So going back here, let's scroll down to table B. Now, table B is different because they have the tail probabilities in the heading. So I would see my tail probability of 0 0.025 right here, and I would need my degrees of freedom to find my T star. So remember, degrees of freedom is just sample size minus 1. So if my sample was 12 and I had a 95% confidence interval, we already said the tail probability for a 95% confidence interval is 0 0.025. So I'd stay in this column and I go down to 11 because 12 is my sample size, right? So my degrees of freedom would be 11. And that would give me the critical value here, 2.201. Now remember, uh, t tables or t distributions are a little bit wider than, um, than normal distributions. All right. So the x bar is from the sample. The t star is from that table, right? We just went there. And then the s sub x is just the standard deviation of x from the sample. So however you got your mean from the sample, you're going to get your standard deviation from the sample to plug that in right here. Over the square root of n, which is just square root of the sample size. And you're going to have the same final product, right? A lower bound and an upper bound. X bar minus the margin of error gives you your lower bound, and X bar plus the margin of error gives you your upper bound. All right. And then conclude. Interpret your interval in context. Okay, I paused it so we could write the, I could write the sentence stem. Um, okay, so we are 95% confident, and remember that number will change if the confidence level changes, right? So if you're doing a 97% confidence interval, then we are 97% confident. That the interval blank to blank, and that's where your numbers come in that you calculated up here, lower bound to upper bound, captures the true population it's either a proportion or a mean, it can't be both. So figure out which one you're calculating and use that word. The true population proportion or mean of context. And here's where you uh, write the context of the problem. If you're talking about average heart rate, you'll say um, captures the true population mean of the average heart rate.